You're listening to another ambitious entrepreneur network.com podcast, the voice for entrepreneurs and small business. Now onto the show. Welcome to the Christian Entrepreneurs Podcast, daily conversations with Christian entrepreneurs to inspire and empower Christian business owners to walk strongly in their faith while build a thriving business that honors him in every way. Now over to your host. And Marie Cross. And welcome to another episode of the Christian Entrepreneurs Podcast. This is episode 113, and I'm your host, Anne Marie Cross, the podcasting queen. Now, my guest today says our vocation is where our greatest passion meets the world's greatest needs. Thus, our cubicles or their cubicles, studios and homes are nothing short of sacred and so are ours. And joining me on today's show is Alexandra Lowry. Alexandra is a professor of finance at Gordon College, which is a Christian college located just outside of Boston. He also leads the college's Master of Science in Financial Analysis program. Now, this one-year program is an alternative to the traditional MBA and a fast-track path to the successful career in finance. Now, in addition, Alexander is a board of mem- directors member for fintech and financial services companies, which means he's transforming, accelerating, and advising businesses that the students he is educating want to work for. That's just incredible that you've got uh, those connections there. Now, on today's show, he's going to share, learn whether you need grad school to be successful in your career, understand why everyone defaults to the traditional MBA, but that isn't always the right path for everyone. He's going to talk about hear how God calls people to use their unique skills and talents for his purposes, as well as learning about integrating your work and your faith. Be the same on Monday as you are on Sunday. Absolutely. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Anne-Marie. Delighted to be here. You reached out not so long ago and uh, was just so thrilled that you were able to book in and talk about uh, what you're going to share today. There's not many people are aware of this. And I know when I was a career coach many years ago, the thought of what am I going to study? What do I want to be when I grow up? The sort of thing can be a really interesting uh, time for, for young people. So learning whether we need grad school to be successful in our careers. Share a little bit more about uh, this, some of the things that uh, young students or even parents need to consider to ensure that they make the right choices. Great question. I think there's so much pressure on young people these days. There's a view that I need to know exactly what I want to do with my life. And let, let's put it in the context of the bigger picture. What does God want me to do with my life? What is the unique combination of my skill sets and interests that I should be doing? And there, if we go back a generation or two, there's an assumption you probably got one job with a major employer, say like IBM, you stayed there your whole life for 40 years, you got a gold watch and you're retired. And that is just not the norm today for a lot of reasons, right? There's not the stability in the market, but there's also so much more opportunity. There's no longer a stigma for people who change careers a couple of times, even reinvent themselves. So one of the things I counsel young people in college days, first of all, you don't need to know what you're going to do when you grow up. I would say, I don't know what I'm going to do when I grow up. And that's partly because I feel like like God has me on a path and a journey, and that is growing and changing as my skill sets get refined, as my experience changes. He can put me into different places. Uh, maybe the easiest way to think about it, a lot of people talk about half time, right? Once you get to about 50 years, you know enough to actually do something else that he can position you for. And the context I put it in is, you know, Jesus basically had a couple maybe three stages of his whole life, right? So the zero to maybe teenage years, he was kind of growing, developing. Then he was beginning to learn and grow and develop in his carpentry world and his professional space. And then 30 years old is when it really started, right? That was the show for him. That was like 10% of his life, 30 to 33-ish. All the rest was preparation, which sort of tells me the first 50 years are kind of warm up for my whole life. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love that. And you know, one of the things that uh, I know for a lot of my clients, and I'm sure you get the same with students, is once you speak to them about that or share that, it takes a whole lot of pressure off. And one of the things too, I mean, you we mentioned that you're in fintech, which of course is finance and technology, and there's so many incredibly new innovations going on that we're with a lot of young people, the jobs that they will step into have not even been developed yet. So uh, w- once that, mm-hmm. that pressure is off, it's like, okay, now I can start to... To really look at, uh, you know, what are some of my interests? What are some of the skills and strengths that I really want to, to develop? Now, you also say, let's talk about this a little bit too, understanding why everyone defaults to the traditional MBA, but that isn't necessarily the right path for everyone. So share a little bit about um, some of the things that if, if someone is thinking about an MBA, what should they consider and what other options are there? And this gives a really good uh, lead way into sharing a bit more about your college and the program you offer. Sure. The easiest way I would describe is we continue that conversation we were just having. What do I want to do when I grow up? So imagine your university, you're going for your first job interviews, trying to figure out where you're going to land. A typical question you're going to get from employers, where do you want to be in five years? What do you want to do? Sort of give me a vision for what your life looks like. How do you want to grow in shape? And there is an easy opt out in the beginning. Like there's a perfect excuse answer you can give that gets, it's a get out of jail free card. You say in five years, I will be in business school. To which every employer nods their head and goes, yeah, that makes total sense. It doesn't answer the question in any way, but it buys you time. And to some extent, business school is perfect if you have no idea what you want to do with your career in the sense of you've tried a couple things that are interesting, but you know there's a bigger world out there. Business school is wonderful like that for you to explore and develop. So let's take my example. I went to Wharton for my MBA. Now I chose Wharton, not only is it a top ranked school, but it is clearly a finance school. It has that amazing brain. You say one word around the world, everybody knows it's finance. You could say, I went to Harvard Business School. If you say I went to Harvard, they go, did you go to the law school? Did you go to the medical school? Did you go to the business school? Did you go to undergrad? They're all really good, great reputations. Mm -hmm. Wharton for me was a brand I was buying. But I went just to study finance, but a two-year MBA is sort of two halves. The first half is your first year. You do a little bit about everything, strategy, operations, accounting, marketing, finance, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You get your summer internship to really test out, do I want to specialize in this space? And your second year, you do your deep dive. So, okay, I've proven I want to be in marketing or finance, whatever it is. And then you're off and running. And the way I think about it is that is a very expensive learning opportunity. It's two years of lost salary, which is a high opportunity cost. Plus there's the cost of the MBA. The average MBA in the U.S. is about $140,000. If you go to the top schools, like where you get to Wharton, like I was, you're getting closer to the 200 mark. And that's a huge amount of debt. And the way that we think about it is if you know exactly what you want to do, for example, if you want to specialize in finance and that's all you want to study, You go to a program like ours where you just take basically the second year of your MBA, that traditional second year where you're focused, you come out with the same technical knowledge, but the opportunity cost is less than half. The price is certainly a lot lower and you're off to your financial career much more successfully. And I won't continue now because we're going to talk about it. Clearly, there's a religious aspect of our program that doesn't exist in the secular. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that... um... I like too about uh, how you bring the conversation to uh, speak about the, with young people is that you're also connected, if you will, and, and tap into what's going on in industry. Because I know that there's some programs that you hear and if we look at university in in Australia you've got these you know very expensive degrees and so forth and and, and obviously MBAs too but when the instructors or the schools are not talking to corporate or what's going on in the industry there's this huge disconnect between well now I've got my degree I've got got this piece of paper but hang on a minute um, (laughs) actual practical application is quite different because the industry has moved on share a bit about the importance of having uh, as an institution obviously as an individual that you can then share that knowledge of what and the discussion with your students and what's actually happening on the ground in in companies in those industries let me put it in perspective so that we think about our educators as two types so you're always going to have the theorists in academia right the people who have studied the books and have lived it for their whole career but we also have a lot of theorists and i want our students to have both perspectives on it so for someone who has been uh, the top ranked analyst to be able to come in or someone who has led different companies to come in and, and do that teaching it gives you two views and 
I don't know that how you could get by otherwise, just like you said. So let's let's take example. So one of my professors at Wharton, very, I won't say his name, but a very well-renowned finance expert in the world, teaches the efficient market theory. And he will say in class, I know this isn't reality. I know this doesn't exist in the real world. The market is not rational. But we don't have a better theory. So we're going to teach it to you. To me, that is a huge disconnect between reality and what we're taught in school. That's not a good use of my time and money, I don't think. So what we want to do is make sure we're connected with people. So when I think about my job leading our program, there's three parts. So in the beginning, they're setting it up. And after a couple of years, that mostly runs itself. But then there's always finding the right students, really smart, passionate people people who are going to make a difference, bringing them, educating them, and then, of course, getting them the career opportunities and opening it up. If you have the greatest program, bring the smartest students, but you don't give them opportunities to go in the world, especially we're talking about for his kingdom. We want to put people into the marketplace with a Christian viewpoint. It's all been for naught, and there's no point of the program because our perspective is we need more people in the marketplace, not only with ethical thinking, but with a Christian perspective, trying to make that difference. Yeah, so, so important. So let's dive in then. Hear how God calls people to use their unique skills and talents for his purposes. Easy to say, but when you're actually in the moment (laughs) trying to figure it out, a different story. So share some insights around this, please. So maybe we should reflect back on 10 years ago. We were in the middle of the Great Recession, and I think we've all seen the stories, the scandals, the headlines that have come out of that. So I was at J.P. Morgan before this role. Jamie Dimon classically said the LIBOR scandal, the London way, all that stuff, that was a tempest in the teapot. And that was just the beginning of all of the fissures that blew up over time and erupted in these big storms. And the reality is that human individuals are fallible. We know that we're all created to work, but we're all tempted. We've all fallen. We all have issues. And it's so easy to just, for example, I was talking to someone the other day who's a pastor. He used to be a master's in accounting working at Arthur Anderson before the Enron scandal. Enron was his client. He was actually helping them try to figure out in a brand new space, there were no regulations. How do these companies figure out how to mark to market how do they value stuff and he was literally walking me through some examples he said this was something brand new and every day i would go in and we would make the best decisions we could but the enron guys are really smart and they knew where they wanted us to go so every day they'd be able to move us a half step in a certain direction before you get, went very long and realized oh my gosh how did we get to this spot from where we'd ever expected to be to get off track, even for people that are practicing their faith. He was a Christian, right? He's now a pastor. And that's partly about it. I'll give you one example from my career. I was in a boardroom with a CEO. I was a management consultant at this point, a CEO and his top team. And they were going to make a decision that I strongly disagreed with. I thought it was an unethical point of view, but I was the hired gun and I was there to give a strategic view. He went around the room for a final perspective and everybody were all at yes men around his boardroom table. They all said yes. And he got to me and I thought, how do I get this strong-willed CEO to realize maybe this is not the right decision? All I can I the decision you're making. I think he realized that's a different answer than I usually get. And he, he gave me an opportunity to come back to him and say why I felt that way. And I shared my view. At the end of the day, he did whatever he wanted to do. But to some extent, it's my job to be a witness where I can and you witness in different ways. We need people in the marketplace influencing other people making decisions. Yeah, so true. I remember uh, uh, decades and decades ago when I was still in the workplace, I was working in an office manager management role for smaller companies. So we got an opportunity to uh, work within the, the finance area but customer service and all of the gamut in between and this company was experiencing some cash flow difficulties and the CEO would say to me just ring our creditors and tell them that the check is in the mail when I knew that the check was not in the mail so I said to him because I rather than no I'm not going to do that because no I wasn't going to do that I said how about we do this I said we want to build a relationship with these creditors an ongoing one because they're our suppliers so I will ring them and let them know that we're struggling and that we want to pay this off so that's what I did I, I had the conversation with each of them and I said every week I will put a check in the mail and if it's not going to go and this is how much it's going to be and if it's not going in the mail I will personally ring you and let you know and you know what they were really happy with that and if the check wasn't going in the mail I would ring them up and they were happy with that so so as you said, there's always a way to approach that uh, a situation which really goes around your, you know, against your values in a way that uh, everybody can uh, can move forward. So I think that's just so very important. Let's talk about 
learning to integrate your work and your faith. I think we touched on this a little bit, but I think for some people, it's like, all right, now I need to put the Sunday face on, right? Monday comes and <laughs> it's a completely different uh, approach and that attitude. Share some insights around this, if you would. And I think everyone needs to figure out their own individual style and way. I don't think there's a single answer that works for everybody, but I'll give you some of my perspectives and the way I approach it, and perhaps I'll give some thoughts, but I imagine people might also change their answers based on when they're at a different organization and a different culture. So these things have to grow and flex. But my, my perspective is not one to be out on, a, on the street corner preaching. That is not my view. I want someone to know that I'm a Christian and, and for them to hold me accountable for my actions. I think that also forces me to be in my best behavior in general. But I feel like if someone gives me an opportunity, I will walk through an open door, right? If God has cracked it open, that's my job to peek inside and see what I can do. So for example, if someone asked me on Monday morning, hey, how was your weekend? I will tell them the typical weekend stuff. I did this with my family. I did that. And on Sunday, I went to church. I will, it's a small, simple way to put it in there. Mm -hmm. And there was one individual. I remember he asked me this the second week in a row. And I said the same sort of thing. I did this. I did this. And I went to church on Sunday. He said, well, you went to church last Sunday. I thought, yeah, no, I go to church. Yeah. Try to go every Sunday. That's what I try to do. And it was very funny for him. Like, oh, every Sunday. That's interesting. Great. You know, my job, I always think about it as it's not for me to take one person and save them. That is never my job. Uh, I feel like if I ever feel like I've done that success, that means other people have planted the seeds along the way and God put me there to harvest. Sometimes my job is to plant a seed for someone else to harvest. Mm -hmm. So you never know what's going to happen. I, if someone comes into my office and talks to me about a problem that they are having, we through it, we will sit there together. And at the end, I will say, and I'm going to pray for you about that when they leave. Often they'll sort of turn and they'll look at me and they'll go, okay, it's fine. Now, if they come back to me with that same problem another time, sometimes if they're dumb enough to come back to me with that same problem another time, at the end, after we've worked through it again, I'll say, how about we pray about together now? And I've never had someone say no to me on that. Mm -hmm. So again, if the opportunity presented itself, I try to take advantage. Yeah. What I love about that, it reminds me of um, a book by uh, called The Daniel Dilemma. There's a bit of the end of it, but um, it's something to do with, you know, really living out the Christian principles, but in a very challenged world. And uh, Chris Hodges or David, Chris or David Hodges, a, a pastor in the US wrote the book. But the principle that he shared was so important is that we can um, demonstrate Christ, if you will, not even mentioning the name, but in our attitude and how we approach uh, situations and challenges, and then grace with truth. So you have to have love there and you have to have the truth, but it's a balance. He said, engaging with someone first and building that relationships before you even, if you do, if they invite you to, um, start talking about some of those truths. And I'm sure that there, are, there may be situations that you very much from a you know, Christian principle follow um, challenges or in your decision making can make a huge difference to someone on your team that can quite admire you for that. And that gives you an opportunity to then share why you made that decision or, or, or took action in that way. Have you found that to be true? I do. And I think the simple analogy that is take someone who's a non-believer, an atheist, agnostic, whatever you want to describe them as. Think about team dynamics when you're building it up with someone. I think as a manager, you have to be able to give someone constructive feedback at times. Now, it shouldn't only be that. My view is you need, I don't know, something in order of five positives for one constructive comment so that people believe you have their best interest heart. And you have to build that up first. Yeah. They know that you're investing them, that you care about them, that you want the best for them, so that when you do give them that feedback, they're able to take it, digest, and go off and be better. Mm -hmm. I think you take that as the same principle to the Christian stuff. Like you said, I, we think about our graduates. You need to be the same technical knowledge as all the technical, secular schools when you come out so that you have that same robust financial knowledge base. I think about what a success like you're sitting next to a Harvard Business School grad, you've been working together for six months, it's midnight, you're both working on stupid projects, and at midnight, you're bored of your stupid projects. So you talk about real life stuff. And this guy's going, you know, I respect you, you have the same knowledge, I've never heard of Gordon College before, but I like you, I like what you stand for. I know you're Christian, you know, I've heard of that coming out of your mouth before. So can I ask you this, I've heard that uh, this thing in the Bible about be still and know that I am God. What the heck does that mean? It doesn't make any sense. Could you imagine what that could lead? I think that's the same sort of thing you're getting to. 
Yeah, absolutely. It, it certainly is. And uh, I, w- I want to, before we end the show, is, is give you an opportunity just to share some of the things that you're noticing in the industry around fintech and financial services, because I know that there, you know, in some industries, unless you hear um, people that are actually working and they've got boots on the ground or they've got conversations and connections with people working in that industry, uh, we don't hear about some of those things. Yet I'm a, a firm believer in that, you know, sometimes what happens in other industries can be a reflection of what's either coming for other industries um, or maybe we can do you know integrate some of the principles and and, and innovations that happening in another industry to our industry to to accelerate or or catapult it forward so what are some of the exciting things that you're seeing well i think you hit it well on the head before some of the stuff that's coming down the pike we can't even imagine yet it's going to be so cool but we can see some of the building blocks so people talk about cryptocurrencies all the time now bitcoin and the others the blockchain that is what they're built upon is a fundamental game changer in finance and from jp morgan down to the smallest companies everybody's trying to figure out how they use this because it is it is better faster smarter and it will revolutionize finance but sometimes you don't have to have a giant revolution like that venmo for me that where you can pay money back and forth is another interesting example of people are trying to think about how do i do something that's existed in a different way and better now Take Venmo versus PayPal, right? Uh, People such as ourselves probably trust PayPal more, but the younger generation loves the fact that Venmo has a social component to it. Think about it as the equivalent to healthcare. Now, they know that if you have a, so I've got a step counter in my wrist, and if you play games with your friend, you're trying to see who has more steps than the other, you will get more steps. Venmo is the same way. You can socially share with your friends, did you spend money on a night out? Did you put money into a savings account? Personally, I don't want those decisions out on the internet, but the young people, People really love that idea and sharing it back and forth. And it can lose your thinking. How do we take best practice in other industries and bring that together with finance, package it in a way that's better for the market? So when you think about entrepreneurs listening to this, Steve Jobs, I think, was a great example. You don't have to be first to market. You just have to have the best mousetrap. Can you redesign some of what's going on there to make it more appealing and easier in access to consumers? Yeah, interesting that you mentioned about uh, Vimo. It, that it, what you just described is is like gamification, isn't it? Where um, there's certain aspects that, mm-hmm. um, and I just recently spoke to a gentleman who was into micro learning, and he was saying that when you include gamification in the micro learning aspect, it's going to compel people to want to to study, particularly if you add points to that that's shared, because everybody likes to know, oh, I'm going to get so many points when I mm-hmm. complete a task or complete a training and and so on so it's interesting as i said to to see what other industries are doing because sometimes as you said you can take some of those uh things that are working really well particularly when we're thinking that there's a lot of millennials that are not only going to enter the workplace they are also our consumers how are they buying how are they looking at um you know th- when you look at the purchase decision what are some of the triggers that really are important for them and uh, i think you know um having yourself as someone who interacts with them on a daily basis who you are going through the program i mean we can learn a lot uh, fr- from that so share with everybody who's listening today and i do apologize every now and again the internet uh, drops out a little bit but not uh, the key points are, are certainly coming across but just share if you would alexander a little bit more about um the course and gordon college how can people get in contact with you to find out more about uh, the offerings that you have Sure. So the website is gordon.edu slash grad finance, and it's a one-year master's in finance program at Gordon College. And the view for what we've talked about is there's three parts of why we did it. So we talked about versus a traditional MBA in that fast track. Another main part, of course, is the fact that we think it should be the Christian perspective instilled in the market versus the secular schools that all will have one ethics course. I had one at Wharton, so they feel like that covers it all. For us, this is part and parcel of the curriculum. The other part is access to boss. Boston. So when you think about finance hubs in America, New York is clearly number one. San Francisco and Boston are very close for number two. 
which means you have access to all the leading firms that are based up here. And we think those combination together really makes it a compelling program. And our perspective is we want to take people, some of whom have never studied finance before, maybe they have quantitative abilities like physics majors or math majors, or I was a history major in college, but I studied what I loved. Those people, and it's sort of a refining program for them to get them ready. For other people, they might have gone to university out in the middle of nowhere where the big companies wouldn't come. So there's a lot of opportunities for people to realize, I want to be not only ready for a career in finance, but to be ready to do it to serve his kingdom and to get out there. And that's what we've built the program to do. So my wife would tell you that my email is always in my hand. My iPhone is basically glued there. So Masters of Science in Financial Analysis, the MSFA, MSFA at gordon.edu is my email address. Fantastic. And we'll put all of the links on the show notes, ambitiousentrepreneurnetwork.com forward slash TCE113. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Alexander. It's been a, a real pleasure to, uh, to hear some of your insights, and particularly to what uh, Gordon College is spearheading in, in this particular area. So thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Henry. I enjoyed it. You've been listening to the Christian Entrepreneurs Podcast, brought to you by BeTheDifferenceMovement.com changing the world one message at a time. Do you feel called to influence real change with your message? Join our supportive community of like-minded influencers, thought leaders, and disruptors at www.bethedifferencemovement.com. That's bethedifferencemovement.com. 